Welcome back to another episode of The Science of Getting High, a show where I use a scientific perspective to talk about mental states that make us feel good. I'm Dr. Falco, not a real doctor, but close enough. And last time I talked about drug harmfulness. We looked at a bunch of different drugs that people abuse and compared how harmful they were. And we determined that psilocybin was the least harmful drug according to scientific research. So this episode, I'm going to talk about how psilocybin works. Now psilocybin is a natural chemical found in a bunch of different types of mushrooms and there are a lot of interesting things about psilocybin. Now psilocybin is something called a prodrug. Now a prodrug does not mean a professional drug. Get those amateur drugs out of here. A prodrug is something that isn't active on its own so it doesn't really do anything in the body in its current form. Our body actually has to break it down to turn it into something that is active and does stuff. And that's kind of interesting because our body generally wants to get rid of strange chemicals and compounds, especially things in mushrooms. A lot of mushrooms make toxic chemicals. So usually our body will just try and get rid of things. But in this case, our body breaks down psilocybin into something that actually gets into the brain, which is kind of crazy. Sometimes our body just messes up with metabolism. There's a natural chemical called aflatoxin that's found in certain types of peanut molds that our body breaks down into a highly carcinogenic and toxic compound that has actually killed people. There was an outbreak of this peanut mold in Kenya that killed multiple people. What I'm trying to say is that our body doesn't know what it's doing sometimes, and sometimes it breaks down chemicals into things that cause harm or are psychoactive, which is what happens with psilocybin. So psilocybin gets broken down into a chemical called psilocin, and psilocin is what causes psychoactive effects. So in this episode, I'm going to talk about how psilocin causes psychoactive effects, and I'll go into a little bit of the research that talks about how psilocin might be effective at treating depression. The brain is super complicated. How psilocin works is super complicated. We still don't really know what's going on, but I'm going to give basically our best understanding right now in as simple a way as I can do it. And I'm going to cover some basic neuroanatomy first, and I'm just going to try and talk about three regions of the brain that are important for how psilocin works. The posterior cingulate cortex, the thalamus, and the medial prefrontal cortex. I'm mostly going to focus on talking about the thalamus and the posterior cingulate cortex. Now, I'm just going to briefly cover how some of these regions in the brain communicate with each other. Now, when two different areas of the brain communicate, sometimes we classify them as a network. And we figure out how networks form by using something called fMRI or functional MRI. And this is basically just looking at blood flow to certain areas of the brain at the same time oxygenated blood specifically, which means the blood is flowing to this area of the brain because it is probably more active. Now with MRI, you'll often see images that look like this, and the red spots in the head represent oxygenated blood flow to areas of the brain at the same time. So if we look at the default mode network, the DMN in this figure, we can see that we've got red spots here, in the posterior cingulate cortex, and then we've also got a red spot here in the medial prefrontal cortex. So this means that these two regions of the brain are likely working together to accomplish a task. In the case of the default mode network, this task is a lack of sensory information. So the default mode network is kind of what our brain does when we don't have any sensory information and we're not thinking about anything in particular. So mind wandering, daydreaming, stuff like this. I recently read a philosophy paper where someone suggested that 60% of our general waking consciousness is occupied by the default mode network. And that when we daydream or mind wander, we don't even have autonomy over it. So we can't even control this process. But I don't know if any of that is actually true, just someone's opinion, but I thought it was kind of interesting. So some important networks that I'll talk about are the default mode network and the salience network. So the salience network is important for determining which sensory information gets perceived into the brain because we don't perceive the world as it is. Our cortex modifies the sensory information we get so that we receive sensory information that's more relevant and important for our survival. All right, now let's finally get on to what psilocin actually does. So psilocin binds to a receptor called the 5-HT2A receptor, which is a type of serotonin receptor. There are a lot of different types of serotonin receptors, about 60 different subtypes, but the 5-HT2A receptor is the most common one. 
and it is found in a lot of different areas of the brain. Basically, it is found everywhere. And I'll just point out that two areas that we do see a lot of serotonin receptor expression or 5-HT2A receptor expression is in the posterior cingulate cortex and in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is where a lot of this activity happens. Now the 5-HT2A receptor basically increases general neural activity for the neurons that it activates. And then remember, receptors are how messages get received in the brain. So we have a neurotransmitter that binds to a receptor. When it activates it, it sends a signal to that neuron to do something. Now just talking about receptor binding isn't always that helpful when we're talking about neuroscience and perception because we need hundreds of neurons to often fire together to have a perception or a thought. So just looking at one individual receptor and one neuron often isn't that helpful. And as you can see, with all of the different areas of the brain that express serotonin receptors, we don't actually know that much about the system just by looking at where these receptors are. So we really have to use fMRI, functional MRI, to look at how psilocin binding to the 5-HT2A receptor can cause varied effects. And that's what I'm going to talk about for most of what I'm going to cover today. I'm also going to say that this field is rapidly growing. Psychedelic research has only really kick-started in the last 10 years. So theories that were out five or six years ago are already sort of being modified. So two or three years from now, what I'm saying might not even be correct. But that's kind of cool because science is a process and we're learning more stuff. So this will sort of give you a snapshot in time of what the current thinking was. Now for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to focus on two ways that psilocin works. And these are suppression of the default mode network. So the default mode network includes the posterior cingulate cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex. And then I'm also going to talk about general global connectivity, also known as cognitive entropy. And this basically means activation of serotonin 5-HT2A receptors causes more general neurotransmission in the brain. So areas of the brain that don't tend to communicate with each other communicate. And we also have more bottom-up processing versus top-down processing. And I'll explain what that is later. So it was originally thought that the default mode network activity was responsible for most of what happens with psychedelics because we see less default mode network activity during psychedelic use. So if you look at fMRI over here, we can see in the posterior cingulate cortex, we have a blue color which represents less connectivity. So it means the posterior cingulate cortex is less active, so we have less default mode network activity. It's also thought that the sense of self is in the posterior cingulate cortex. So when the posterior cingulate cortex activity decreases, we get something called ego dissolution. This is maybe true or not true. I think we're still sort of figuring this out. Why this is important is because people who have depression often have high default mode network activity, and this can lead to unproductive ruminative thoughts where people just sort of constantly run through the same cyclical thought pattern that isn't helpful and can drive them into a negative mental state. So this is one of the ways that we think psilocin might be useful for treating depression. There's also some evidence that changes in oscillations in the PCC or posterior cingulate cortex is associated with ego dissolution. I'm not going to go into what alpha oscillations are, but it's basically an indicator of brain neural activity. And ego disintegration is another fun thing to define. So these scientists, um, David Nutt, once again, our friend from uh, last episode that did the drug harmfulness studies. So he came up with something called the ego dissolution index. And I just think this scale is kind of funny with the questions that they ask people because they will give people psilocybin or LSD and then ask them to rate on a scale of zero to 100 how at one with the universe they feel which I think is a little bit unfair if you're tripping on a psychedelic drug and then you're trying to rate how at one with the universe you feel, where 100 makes you feel more at one with the universe. I feel like that's going to confuse people and maybe mess stuff up. 
but their data does seem to be pretty good. Now they compared this ego dissolution scale to the ego inflation scale, where basically people feel more important than others or what they're saying is more important. And this was cool because they had people report cocaine experiences and how their ego felt versus psychedelic drugs. And then we can see this graph, which is not very well done. Look at the x-axis. So this one we have LSD dose, so we have the dose of drug, but then this one, it just says dose. It doesn't even tell us what drug it is. So come on guys, we can do better. That's better. So we can see with LSD in the blue line, ego dissolution continues to go up as we get an increase in dose. And with cocaine, ego dissolution stays constant, but ego inflation just skyrockets, which I think makes a lot of sense. I don't know if you've ever been around someone who's high in cocaine while they're telling a story, but wow, do they think it is the most interesting and exciting thing that has ever happened to anybody. All right, so that sort of covers the PCC and the default mode network and how that influences the effects of psilocin. Now I'll talk about the increased global connectivity. And this is where we have more bottom up processing. So the way that we perceive the world is not how it is. So when we see visual or optical illusions like this one right here, the hollow mask illusion, which is kind of creepy, sorry, but it does demonstrate what's happening. So as the face turns around, our brain actually tells us that the face is facing us. And that's because faces are salient to us because faces are important for our survival. So this is called top-down cognitive processing because our visual information is telling us that the face is facing away from us, but then our cortex tells us, no, the face is looking at us. This is an important, this is how faces should look. So what's happening here is the cortex is modifying information from the thalamus. So what happens with psilocin is that the cortex does not modify information as much in the thalamus. We get more information relay from the thalamus to the cortex and we actually see that the PCC does not influence the thalamus and the thalamus influences the PCC. So the thalamus is more in the center of the brain, the PCC is more in the top, so this is bottom up processing. So what this means is that sometimes people can actually see through visual illusions when they're on psychedelic drugs. So there was a study that reported people on LSD were able to distinguish this hollow mask replica or illusion and they could see when the face was seeing away, which means that people doing psychedelic drugs see a more true world than sober people. That's not really true, but this modification of the salience network is just one um, instance of where that sort of happened. Generally, the hallucinations you have aren't how the world actually is. So how does this relate to depression or therapy? Let's get back on track. So talking about the thalamus, it's thought to act like a gate where typically the gate is closed and it limits connection between different areas of the brain. And we think of these different connections as entropy in the brain. So generally the brain is under a state of low entropy, which is good. So entropy means disorder. It comes from thermodynamics. It kind of means chaos. It's one of the laws of the universe. Entropy is always increasing. And in the brain, you could imagine how this wouldn't be the best thing to have because we wouldn't be able to have normal thoughts. We probably wouldn't be able to function if just random neurons were firing all the time. So it's thought that with rigid patterned types of thinking that can happen in depression or OCD or addiction is another area where psilocybin is thought to be useful. By decreasing that thalamic gate, opening it up, increasing kind of random connections in the brain, we might form new patterns that could be helpful. And it's been found that psilocybin and other psychedelics can increase synaptogenesis, so forming new connections in the brain. And this might be helpful as kind of like a reset mechanism. And this is a new theory, so not really known how much truth there is to this, but some people think that the body and the brain actually have a natural stress response under periods of extreme stress or near-death experiences we get a huge release of natural serotonin, our natural neurotransmitter, and it might activate these 5-HT2A receptors in a similar way to psilocybin and kind of form new breakthroughs. And this is called a pivotal mental state. And it's thought that this can happen at some points in people's lives where 
they're undergoing some type of trauma. And what happens is when this flood of serotonin gets released, it can go one of two ways. You can either get positive, maybe creative thoughts that might be beneficial to your life, or it can swing the other way and go towards psychosis. And this is one of the ways that it's thought psychotic episodes can happen. So this is one theory. And um, psychosis is an example of too much entropy in the brain. So with depression, we have not enough entropy. With psychosis, we have too much entropy. So it's thought that people who have psychosis should not take psychedelics because it would be detrimental. So speaking of the therapeutic benefit of psilocybin, to wrap this all up, there have been a lot of studies looking at this, a lot of promising results. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to report one study that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, probably one of, if not the most powerful clinical trial looking at whether or not psilocybin can be effective at treating depression. So they compared psilocybin to a commonly prescribed SSRI, and they found that psilocybin was more effective at treating depression, so it decreased depression scores by eight points, whereas the SSRI decreased depression scores by six points. However, the two points was not enough to be considered statistically significant, so it did not perform significantly better, but it demonstrates that there definitely is certainly something behind the use of psilocybin for depression. All right, I am tired of talking about drugs these last two episodes, so the next few I'm going to focus on mental states that make us feel good that don't have to do with drugs, but they might touch on a lot of these things. So I'm going to talk about prayer, meditation, extreme sports, adventure sports, and I think that stress response that might happen from extreme sports might cause a serotonin release that could be similar to that pivotal mental state. So stay tuned for that one. I'll see you next time.